bacteria are alive, which means they obviously have to have something to keep them alive, right? So they've got to have some sort of nutrition. So they've constantly got to be getting fed from their environment. Um, they're not necessarily able to move in some cases or even in the cases where they are uh, not very long distances. So they're, they're going to have to have uh, some sort of a food source nearby. So all organisms require certain similar elements such as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, sulfur, calcium, iron, sodium, chloride, magnesium, and a few other things. In humans, there's about 24 uh, elements that are uh, contained in, in a human organism. And the similarities exist because of uh, similar origins among organisms. So there's this term essential nutrient. You've all heard it. Um, it's written on the back of your cereal box. It says, you know, so many, you know, 23 essential vitamins and minerals or something like that. And people don't understand what it means, though. A lot of times people think it, if it's essential, that means it's necessary. And although it is necessary, that's not what the definition is because there are other things that are necessary for life that are not essential. What the, that term actually means is... It is some sort of a nutrient that the organism cannot produce itself. So it has to get it from uh, eating. So non-essential nutrients, although they are also necessary, uh, an organism can manufacture it from other parts inside the body. So there's two categories of nutrients, macronutrients, which are required in large quantities, hence macro. Macro means large. Um, and these are things that uh, kind of make up the structure of the organism. Um, large parts of the cell structure, you know, cell membranes and things like that. Examples of macronutrients are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, uh, those are the three uh, elements that are in all carbohydrates. For example, like you know, glucose molecule is C6H12O6, um, and then of course, if the, if one's macronutrients, the other one obviously has to be micronutrients. These are also called trace elements, and just as the name implies, they are needed in traces or smaller amounts. And these are involved in things such as enzyme function, which we will discuss, uh, I think, next chapter. Um, maintenance of protein structure. Um, and examples of these things are like manganese, zinc, nickel, uh, things that we need, but we need in very small amounts. Matter of fact, these things can actually become toxic in large amounts. All right, so there's this term inorganic. Um, and something that is inorganic, which uh, is the opposite of organic, it may not have been good to put it in this exact order, but I did. Um, something that's inorganic doesn't contain both hydrogen and carbon. Uh, that sounds weird to say it that way, so let's just define organic and it'll make more sense. So organic contains both carbon and hydrogen, um, which means something that's inorganic doesn't. It's missing at least one of those. For example, something that is, that is organic would be oh, like glucose, which I mentioned earlier, which is C6H12O6. So it's got C's and O's in it, which means or excuse me, um, C's and H's in it, which means that it is organic. So something that would be similar but that would not be organic would be like carbon dioxide, CO2. So it's got carbons, but it has no hydrogen, so that would be considered an inorganic molecule. Okay, so inorganic nutrients are nutrients that are inorganic, and of course organic are organic. Okay, so organic nutrients come from other living things. Um, and matter of fact, they can be other living things. Um, uh, things like um, methane, which is CH4, um, natural gas, um, produced uh, in part 
by bacteria that are digesting organic uh, organic things uh, such as um, sewer gas for example creates methane um, dairy farms will collect this methane from cow manure and use it to heat their homes and things like that in fact in India it's a fairly common practice um, because of the cattle that uh, are considered sacred they don't kill them and so there's cattle everywhere and anyway they'll use the uh, manure to cook with and well the gases from the manure to cook with and things like that um, so besides being simple they can also be large polymers such as carbohydrates um, which would be things like um, chains of um, sugars such as cellulose, um, glycogen, starches, things like that, uh, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, which is like DNA and, and whatnot. Um, so when we look at this, the chemical makeup of a cell, um, we can break down its constituents. And so starting with the cytoplasm, let's take a look at it. So 70% of the cytoplasm is water. So we talk about the cytoplasm being the liquid that everything is dissolved in. Well, of course, it's dissolved in water, right? Also, we have inside there proteins. Um, that's the next most common thing next to the um, water. And when you dry the water out, which is inorganic, only 3% of what's left over is inorganic. So 97% organic. Um, so there's this little, I guess it's an acronym, CHOMPS. Um, CHOMPS is <clears throat> an acronym for carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, which makes up 96% of the dry weight of the cell. Now, bearing in mind, these are 99.9% uh, .9 of these are in molecular form, not in atomic form. Um, so a phosphorus is going to be joined with an organic molecule to make the whole molecule organic. Um, so that bullet point there is pretty much what I just said. So because we build these molecules with little building blocks, we only need a handful of these building blocks. Like I said, in a human, there's only 24. And in fact, in bacteria, and, and uh, or a lot of bacteria, it's even fewer than that. Um, but we can build, you know, hundreds of thousands of things with them, different di different compounds. Um, so this table right here, six one in your book, is trying to illustrate uh, the dry weight of organic and inorganic, and then shows some uh, uh, examples. So you can see over here. Proteins make up 50% of the dry weight, RNA making up the next biggest category, and 50% of the dry weight is made of carbon, and of course there's carbon in both proteins and RNA because there's a ribose sugar on there, right? So let's discuss how these microbes actually get their food. We categorize them several ways, but one of the ways is based on where they get their carbon from. So the term heterotroph, um, and you remember hetero means different, um, they have to get their carbon uh, in organic form. So they've got to consume an organic molecule in order to uh, utilize the carbon from it. An autotroph, auto means self, uh, uses inorganic carbon dioxide as its carbon source. Um, I think the reason why they use self and, and hetero here is I, because I believe that means that it can um, manufacture uh, other organic molecules itself rather than having to get the organic molecules from something else. So these have the ability to convert carbon dioxide into organic compounds. Um, plants do this, for example. 
I know that's not a microbe, um, but microbes do, some microbes do the same thing. So plants will take carbon dioxide and sunlight and water and put it through various chemical reactions and actually create sugar and oxygen as a byproduct. So these autotrophs are not dependent on other living things. And so you'll find these in some very strange places, okay? So besides categorizing these microbes based on where they get their carbon, we can also categorize them based on where they get their energy. So a phototroph is a microbe that can photosynthesize, meaning use the sun's light, um, or I guess any other light source that has strong enough um, energy to um, create other molecules. A chemotroph, chem means chemical, are microbes that get their energy from chemical compounds um, by releasing energy from the bonds in the compounds. And so these do not need to uh, live in um, the sunlight. So to make sense of this, your book has this table. And so you can see that there's two categories, autotroph and heterotroph. Okay, But what you may not have realized is that each of these uh, can have the subcategories of photoautotroph and chemoautotroph. So um, as well as uh, photoheterotroph and chemoheterotroph. So an autotroph, a photoautotroph is an autotroph that gets its energy from sunlight. A heterotroph, a photoheterotroph is a heterotroph that gets its energy from sunlight. Okay, but the difference is the carbon source. Okay, so autotrophs get it from carbon dioxide. Heterotrophs have to get it from some organic molecule. So let's discuss those in some detail here. So photoautotrophs are photosynthetic, which means they can uh, perform photosynthesis um, and they produce organic molecules using CO2. Chemoautotrophs, there's two different kinds. There are chemoorganic autotrophs. Um, generally, you don't see two O's together like that. They usually drop one. Um, so I'm not, it's kind of strange why they don't hear. Um, but chemoorganic uh, you can probably figure out from the um, word there that they use organic compounds for energy. So chemochemical, organic, organic. Um, but they use inorganic compounds as their carbon source. A lithoautotroph uh, uses inorganic minerals completely. They don't need sunlight or organic nutrients. They can get everything they need from these inorganic minerals. Um, lith means stone, um, like a lithotripsy is, is, uh, is breaking up a kidney stone using sound waves. Um, so lith means stone, and so you can see minerals are what makes uh, stones. So that's, you can see how they got their name. Uh, so they have very interesting methods for getting their energy, um, some, some really strange methods. Uh, compared to the majority of uh, organisms. Um, things that they can do is with, they, they remove electrons from things like um, hydrogen molecule, hydrogen sulfide, sulfur, iron, things like that. And they combine them with carbon dioxide and hydrogen to create uh, their own organic molecules. So then uh, we need to talk about heterotrophs as well. So most heterotrophs are chemoheterotrophs, which, by the way, is what you are. You're a chemoheterotroph, um, which means they derive both carbon and energy from organic compounds. So they get the energy from these molecules in a process called respiration. That's what we do. It's called cellular respiration or internal respiration. Um, and, and, and a lot of bacteria do the same thing. Um, or a process called fermentation, which is how we get uh, beer um, and other alcohol. Um, so there's two categories of chemoheterotrophs. They're saprobes and parasites. A saprobe is something that feeds on dead organisms. So these are the things that decompose uh, 
dead animals and dead plant matter and, and things like that. Um, they are what helps us to uh, be able to recycle these nutrients. If we didn't have these things around, I've mentioned this probably before, but the world would be piled up with dead animals and that would be a problem. So they help with things like returning nutrients back to soils and things like that. So parasites then get their nutrients from either cells or uh, the tissues of something that is alive. So we've mentioned this in previous chapters, um, but they can be anything from viruses to helminths. So ectoparasites, ecto means outside, like, you know, same thing as exo, like the exoskeleton of a, uh, I don't know, crab or spider or something, uh, means the skeleton is on the outside. So you can imagine an ectoparasite lives on the body or outside the body. Endo means within or inside, which means that endoparasites live in the body, um, which helminths would be an example of that, roundworms, things like that. Um, so all parasites are pathogens. That's the, basically the definition. If it's not a pathogen, it's not a parasite. It's a, it's a, a symbiont, right? Symbiotic relationship. Um, so pathogens, of course, cause damage or death. So intracellular parasites, which is what a virus is, um, live within the cell, right? Example, leprosy, bacillus, uh, syphilis, spirochete. Um, obligate parasites, um, the word obligate uh, means they are obligated. Um, you hear cowboys say they're much obliged. That means that they are obligated, which means they have to do something. So obligate parasites um, have to live inside of a host. They cannot live outside of a host. Parasites that are not obligate can sometimes be um, cultured without the, the use of a living host. So the vast majority of microbes that cause disease in humans are chemoheterotrophs. That's why they're living off of humans, because we have we are an organic uh, molecular source, right? Okay, so remember this word uh, essential. Key point being right here. Um, necessary, yes, but that is not why we call it essential. It's this part right here. Cannot manufacture these themselves. Uh, examples, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphate, and sulfur. Um, these are all things that obviously we can't manufacture them because they're atoms. Really, when we talk about manufacturing, we're talking about molecules. Um, so this table here in your book just kind of lists the um, essential nutrients and some of the things that we might use them for. For example, carbs, lipids, nucleic acids all need to have carbon, um, anything that's organic, obviously. Um, you can go ahead and read through that on your own. So some other important nutrients, sodium. Um, we use for cell transport, meaning, and that's not transporting a cell, that's transporting things in and out of a cell. Um, humans use it all over the place for uh, nerve conduction, muscular contraction, muscular uh, signaling, um, regulation of water in the kidneys, but bacteria will use some of the same principles uh, because you can set up an osmotic gradient using sodium. Calcium is used for <clears throat> stabilizing the cell wall, and we used it, as you remember, in endospores uh, to make them more resistant to heat um, and other things. Magnesium uh, used in chlorophyll, which is the photosynthetic pigment um, in photosynthesizing organisms, uh, also a stabilizer of membranes and also in ribosomes. Iron, important in cytochrome proteins, which is part of cellular respiration, which we'll discuss in detail in another chapter, which is deriving energy from food. Um, zinc is a regulatory element 
Um, it's used, I think, a lot as a coenzyme. Um, I don't remember if we've talked about that yet or not, but um, we will discuss these cofactors that are these little uh, regulatory molecules or atoms on an enzyme. Um, they're using these things called zinc fingers, which help the um, enzymes uh, used for things like um, you know, RNA production, which is transcription, um, help these enzymes adhere to the DNA. Um, but some others, copper, cobalt, nickel, molybdenum, manganese, silicon iodine, boron. Um, if you ever look at a, uh, uh, a supplement, like a, like a mineral supplement that you take you know, with your vitamins, you'll see all these um, listed on the back of them. So they're needed in small amounts. Uh, by certain microbes and, for that matter, other multicellular organisms like humans as well. Okay, metals can be toxic to microbes or any other animal for that matter. Um, what happens is these metal ions uh, disrupt some specific processes in, in the, uh, the pathways of chemical processes in the organism and... Um, cause some sort of a disease or they can um, deposit themselves in you know nervous tissue or whatever in multicellular organisms um, so transport mechanisms um, again this is transporting things in and out of the cell so it's a little bit difficult to understand how this hat works so it's important to, to, to know what is actually responsible for these molecules moving um, for some of these, not all of them, the driving force is just the atomic and molecular movement. What that means is this Brownian movement of particles. All molecules and atoms are moving all the time. They're essentially vibrating or bouncing around. And it's the states of matter that really um, are, well, let, me, let me say that the other way. It's the movement that, uh, determines the, the state of matter in which it is meaning if the movement is very low the state of matter is a solid um, if it is higher the state of matter is liquid and if it's super high it's a gas all right so example the difference between ice liquid water and water vapor all three of those things are water the difference is how far the molecules are apart from each other. So ice is a solid, which means the molecules are barely moving, which means they're very, very tight together. Um, still moving, but very, very little. Um, a liquid, they're moving a lot more, um, but a gas, they're moving a massive amount. When you, uh, what creates a bubble in a boiling pot of water is um, a molecule that gets enough energy that it starts to move really really quickly and it essentially creates um, a cavity that it, that it that it's in and that's what a bubble is so the first transport mechanism we're going to discuss is diffusion and diffusion by definition is the movement of molecules or atoms from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration um, so let's see, let's read this. Atoms or molecules move in a gradient from an area of high density or concentration to an area of low density or concentration. Um, so the gradient, what that means is if you think of uh, high concentration as being up here and low concentration as being down here, that would create a line between the two and that would be the gradient. And so when you're going downhill, from high to low, that's considered to be going with or along the concentration gradient. If you're going the opposite direction, going uphill, um, it is considered to be going against the concentration gradient. So what they're showing here is a cup of coffee with a sugar cube in it. Um, the sugar cube will create uh, hydrogen bonds with the water inside the coffee and that will cause the sugar cube to dissolve and once the sugar molecules have dissolved into um, 
individual sucrose disaccharide molecules, they will begin to randomly distribute themselves throughout this cup of coffee. Um, the hotter the cup is, the faster the movement. That's one of the things that, well, just like at the boiling water, eventually you get to a point where it actually boils, but the, the, the warmer it is, the, the quicker the, uh, the movement of the molecule. Therefore, if you put, say, a sugar cube in a cold iced tea and one in hot iced tea, I'm sure you realize that the one in the hot would dissolve much, much quicker. And that's because of the speed of the movement, that Brownian movement of those molecules. Uh, so all molecules, as I said, are always moving, even if it's a, 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 um, a solid. But, but as temperature increases, um, the molecular movement actually increases with it. Okay, so as I mentioned, they're going to eventually randomly distribute themselves throughout this cup of coffee. Now, let me bring, let me talk about a whole bunch of other stuff really quick. Um, first of all, it's important to understand that diffusion, we tend to look at it one-sided, like we put a sugar cube in and then the sugar molecules diffuse. Um, what you got to understand, though, is it's it's all the molecules. What I mean by that is the coffee is also diffusing. So the illustration I usually use in my classes is uh, if you put a drop of food coloring in a glass of water, but you don't stir it up, eventually the food coloring is going to distribute itself evenly throughout that glass. It might take, you know, an hour or two, um, but eventually the whole glass is going to be one even color. That's called reaching a state of equilibrium. Um, once it reaches that state of equilibrium, movement of the molecules doesn't stop. But for every molecule or atom that moves one way, um, on average, another one is going to move the opposite way. And so you don't end up with any net movement once equilibrium has been reached. Okay. Um, but one of the things I wanted to make sure you understood about that is it's not just the food coloring molecules that are distributing themselves throughout the water, it's also the water distributing distributing itself into the food coloring, right? Because we're talking about concentration and concentration goes from high to low. So um, the water is moving from an area where it's high, um, which is the water because 100% water is the highest concentration you can get, right? You can't get any higher concentration than pure something. So it's going to, the water molecules are going to be moving into the dye and, and understand it's completely random. There's no, these molecules and atoms aren't thinking, oh, I need to move over here because it's high concentration here. Um, the illustration I use to, to uh, show that is if you took a, a, say a jar and you fill, you know, about half of it with say black sand and, and the other half about with um, white sand and you shake it up. That shaking simulates the movement of the molecules. Eventually, the sand is going to distribute itself evenly and you're not, you're gonna end up with like gray sand, right? Black and white mixed evenly. Um, but as you continue to shake it, it's, it's never gonna go back to being black and white sand separated. It's always gonna stay mixed all up because for every black sand that goes one way, a piece of black sand goes the opposite way and takes its place and the same goes for the white sand. So once it's mixed evenly, that's called reaching a state of equilibrium. Um, one other thing. So it's easy, or we talk about liquid, but, but the same things go for a gas. So if I you know, set a bottle of perfume out on the table and I open it up, what's gonna happen? You know, the vaporized um, perfume molecules are going to go out into the air and randomly distribute themselves evenly. And think about this. If I put a drop of food coloring in a glass of water, in order for it to di distribute itself evenly, which we're talking is a few inches, it could take a couple of hours. But if I open up a bottle of perfume, the amount of time that it would take to go from the bottle of perfume to your nose, which could be you know a couple of feet away, would be seconds, if that, okay? And that illustrates how much faster the molecules are moving in a gas compared to in a liquid.
molecules dissolved in a solution are in constant random motion due to their kinetic energy. One result of this motion is that dissolved molecules become evenly distributed throughout the solution. This tendency of molecules to spread out is an example of diffusion. But how do these molecules come to be evenly distributed? Let's start with a beaker of plain water. What will happen if we now add a lump of sugar to the water? A lump of sugar is composed of many individual sugar molecules, and even as a solid lump, the individual sugar molecules are in motion. When the lump is dropped into the water, it begins to dissolve. Individual sugar molecules move randomly and constantly from the area where they are common to the area where they are scarce. This type of motion, when molecules move from areas of their higher concentration to areas of their lower concentration, is called diffusion. Diffusion continues until all the sugar molecules become evenly dispersed throughout the beaker. The rate of diffusion is affected by temperature, size of molecules, and the steepness of the concentration gradient. Although not specifically shown in this animation, this is one of the processes whereby materials are exchanged between a cell and its environment. So that was diffusion. And now we're going to talk about osmosis. And you can't understand osmosis if you don't understand diffusion. Because osmosis relies on the principle of diffusion to work. So... So osmosis is the diffusion of water through a selectively or well, so you can either call it a selectively permeable membrane or a differentially permeable membrane. Most people say selectively permeable, um, or you even may hear the term semi-permeable. Um, what that means is it lets some things through but doesn't let other things through. Now, in the case of osmosis what we're discussing that it is letting through is the water but not letting other things through such as say sugar molecules or sodium or something like this okay and so what, what we do with osmosis is we put a membrane uh, between two solutions and in this solution the solvent which is water in this case can pass through but the solutes which is the stuff dissolved in the water cannot and so because of the principle of diffusion we know that these water molecules are going to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration which means wherever there is um, more stuff dissolved the water is going to have a tendency to move in that direction until equilibrium can be re reached. So this picture here is trying to illustrate um, osmosis. So if you look, they've put some sort of a balloon um, inside this water. And so the beaker contains pure water, which is what these little blue dots are. And inside of this balloon, there's something dissolved. It could be, um, like I said, sodium ions, chloride ions. Um, it could be, uh, you know, glucose molecules. It doesn't really matter. Just whatever is dissolved in here, um, different proteins and such. And so what's going to happen then is because of diffusion, this is going to want to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And so the, the, the concentration of, of water outside is 100%. And obviously it's not in here, which means this is high, this is low. And so what we're going to see is we're going to see the water move into this sac. And what this is trying to illustrate, if you look here, here's the level, the water level in this tube that's hooked to this little balloon thing. And as the water comes in, it starts to push the water up because more water is coming in here. Now, I, this is kind of not drawn well because it looks like there's more solutes over here than there is here. Well, there are, but it shouldn't be that way because I don't know where these things mysteriously came from. So just ignore that. 
um, really what we're concerned about is uh, the fact that water is coming in and it's pushing the level of water up um, because the volume of water is, is, is increasing. So living membranes, which would be cell membranes, act as semi-permeable membranes. And so they let certain things in and they do not let other things in. One of the things that can move freely in and out of a cell is water. So most cells, especially in multicellular organisms, are surrounded by some free water. And the amount of water that is able to go in and out of the cell uh, has a, a huge impact on the cellular processes that occur. And just like diffusion, the relative concentrations um, have an impact on how fast this osmosis process occurs um, on either side of the uh, membrane. Okay, so there's this thing called osmolarity of solutions. So when you're measuring the osmolarity, that's just a fancy way of saying the concentration. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is called an isotonic solution. So an iso, iso means same, like an isosceles triangle has the same angles and the same sides, the length of sides. Um, isotonic and tonic, uh, you know, t uh, it's all the same sort of root word as tone, um, but the, the tonicity, I guess, really has to do with the um, concentration of something. So if you mix up a tonic, you know, you're mixing up, you know, something inside of a, a, I guess, two liquids together. But anyway, so in an isotonic solution, the environment inside, whatever it is, whether it's a balloon or a cell or whatever, is the same as the environment outside. In other words, each side of the semi-permeable membrane has the same concentration, okay? And so what this picture is showing here is uh, this is a gram-positive cell, right? And this is some other kind of a cell or um, organism of some sort. Um, but what it's... Sh oh, yeah, so it's a gram-negative, right? Um, what it's showing here is... No, not gram-negative. It doesn't have a cell wall. So this would be um, like a protozoan or something like that. Um, anyway, what it's showing here is the you're seeing that water is moving in and water is moving out. But the key here is that it's moving out at the same rate. Um, there's no uh, net movement. So for every molecule that goes out, another molecule goes in. And so nothing ever changes. So don't forget, the atoms and molecules are still moving. So this is the most stable environment because the cell doesn't have to do anything. If it lives in an isotonic solution, it doesn't have to do anything to compensate. Because if it does live in a hyper or hypotonic solution, which we're going to get to in just a second, it's going to have to be pushing things in and out of this, in or out of the cell in order to keep the thing from, well, we'll show you. Um, so parasites, for example, are likely to be living in an isotonic solution. So this next one is a hypotonic solution. And I need to explain what we're discussing here because hypo means less than, right? Um, or under or something like that or below. Um, normally when we talk about osmosis, we're discussing the concentration of water. We, I don't know, we just think of it as in terms, uh, think of it in terms of the water, meaning the concentration of the water. But when we're talking about these solutions and we use the term hypotonic, hypertonic, and isotonic, we're actually referencing the concentration of the solutes that are dissolved in the water. And so if we have two compartments, um, like inside of a balloon and outside of a balloon, or inside of a cell and outside of a cell, when we say hypotonic, what that means is um, the solution on the outside has 
fewer solutes than the solution on the inside. In other words, it has a higher concentration of water and a lower concentration of dissolved things in the water. And it's important to understand those two things are inversely proportional, which means if you raise the concentration of the solute, you automatically lower the concentration of the water by the same amount, by definition. You, you can't not do it. And vice versa, if you lower the solutes, you raise the concentration of water, right? Um, what I mean by that is you start with pure water. As soon as you put, say, 1% of something dissolved in it, then automatically the water is now only 99%, right? And if you put 50% of something dissolved in it, then automatically the other 50% is the water. So as you raise one, you lower the other one. So a hypotonic solution is where you put a cell or something in this um, uh, into a uh, solution that has a uh, lower concentration of solutes. And so this picture over here, what this is trying to show you is it's showing the water molecules they've left here and they've gone inside the cell because water wants to go from high to low. And if the solution out here had a low concentration of dissolved things, then by definition it has to have a high concentration of water, right? And we know that because of diffusion, these molecules are gonna go from high concentration to low concentration. So they're gonna come from outside the cell and go inside the cell. Now on a plant or on a bacterial cell as a cell wall, it's going to just increase the pressure on the inside. On a cell without a cell wall, because it's not as strong, as this water moves in, the cell will eventually explode. So putting something in pure water is as hypotonic as it gets, because you can't get any less. Uh, any lower of a concentration of dissolved substances than zero, right? And pure water has zero dissolved substances in it. So if you put a cell like a bacterium or a red blood cell or something inside of a uh, pure water, water is going to rush inside the cell. So the net direction of movement is from the solution into the cell. And as I said, cell walls or uh, cells without cell walls will burst. Um, a slightly hypotonic environment can be okay for bacterial cells, like I said, because they have the cell wall and they can resist um, bursting because they're stronger. And what this is saying is the membrane, the cell membrane is as big as it can get inside the cell as opposed to this picture where it's all shriveled up inside okay the cell wall doesn't change shape because it's rigid um, not only that there's no the stuff moves freely in and out of this because of the, the pore proteins and so there's no um, pressure that's actually set up from this side of the cell wall to this side. It's just the cell membrane. Okay, so this is illustrating a hypertonic solution. So this is where we have a high concentration of dissolved stuff outside of the cell. So the water concentration is higher inside the cell. And so we know that um, water moves from high to low Therefore, it's going to leave the cell and go out, and that's going to cause the cell membrane to shrivel up. Um, and so in the case of a bacterium, it's going to look like this. In the case of a, of a cell without a cell wall, it's going to shrivel up and look like this. As you see, the water has left and gone out now. And so this is because of what we call osmotic pressure, um, which is just the um, tendency of movement 
from high to low concentration. So this is the reason why hypertonic solutions, such as um, when we put something in a high concentration of salt or sugar, um, preserves food. And it's not because it keeps bacteria out. It's that when the bacterium goes into it, it dies because it causes the water to leave the bacterium and it kills it. Um, salted ham or like salt pork. Um, that's why uh, you can have a raw piece of ham, throw a bunch of salt on it, uh, or a raw piece of pork, throw a bunch of salt on it, um, and you can eat it, um, which is how they used to preserve meat. Um, well, I mean, they still do, but it was one of the only ways to preserve meat. So if you wanted to sail across the ocean or something like that, um, uh, and couldn't bring live animals with you, you could bring um, salt pork and the back, there would no, bacteria wouldn't live on it because it would die. You know, honey, for example, bacteria won't live in honey. In fact, they use honey as a, an antimicrobial on wounds sometimes. Um, and I think it's uh, reasonably effective, um, but it's because of this principle that we're talking about right now is whatever bacterium or bacteria live on it, it will, it will kill them. So that's all been talking about water, right? But how do we move the solutes in and out of the cell? Well, we do it by transporting them. So we call it cellular transport, which as I said, is not transporting a cell, it's transporting things in and out of the cell. So when we transport something, it requires energy. And so we call that being active. So active transport, has some some features that we need to discuss. Um, one is that it is pushing things against the concentration gradient, or in other words, it's going uphill. It's the the analogy I use for active transport uh, is going to build a bear. You know, you go to that store in the mall and you look on the wall and you pick out your animal hide and you throw that skin up on the um, counter and give it to the lady and she stuffs that thing full of stuffing, right? Well, you're shoving that stuffing in there and it, and it and you have to force it. Why? Because it's full. There's too high of a concentration in there already. And this is an analogy, not an example. Okay, so it's not perfect, but you'll get the idea. And so it requires energy to force it in there, right? But if you take a knife and slice that belly of the bear open, that stuffing is going to pop out. Why? Because it then is moving with the concentration gradient, right? So again, just an analogy, not an example. Um, but if you can kind of tie those two things together, it'll help you um, remember that, I think. Um, so that's one of the types of active transport. But the other type is you can be moving along with the concentration gradient, but you actually are speeding it up. So if you just let it go, it's still going to happen but you can actively transport it and let it and make it go a lot faster. Um, active transport requires specific membrane proteins such as permeases and pumps like a sodium potassium pump. I uh, mentioned that earlier, but it requires energy. So those are the features that all active trans or that active transport may have. So some things that are um, transported actively are like monosaccharides, amino acids, organic acids, phosphates, metal ions, and there are various ways these are actively transported that we're going to talk about um, in just a few minutes. The sodium potassium pump is an active transport mechanism. Three sodium ions bind to the protein channel, and an ATP provides the energy to change the shape of the channel that in turn drives the ions through the channel. One phosphate group from the ATP remains bound with the channel. The sodium ions are released on the other side of the membrane outside of the cell, and the new shape of the channel has a high affinity for potassium ions, and two of these ions now bind to the channel. This binding again causes a change in the shape of the protein channel, 
and this conformational change releases the phosphate group on the cytoplasm side. This release allows the channel to revert to its original shape, and as a result, the potassium ions are released inside the cell. In its original shape, the channel has a high affinity for sodium ions, and when these ions bind again, they initiate another cycle. The important characteristic of this pump is that both sodium and potassium ions are moving from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. That is to say, each ion is moving against its concentration gradient. This type of movement can only be achieved by the constant expenditure of ATP energy. So, as always, ATP is what provides the energy for this process to happen. So, one type, um, that, that type of actor, that, what we just saw there is, is what we generally just refer to as active transport. Um, but, but all of these are under a category of active transport. Um, it's slightly confusing, I admit it. Um, but if they require energy, it's active. So this one here is called, or this is another category that's part of active transport called endocytosis. Um, this is what they say, eating and drinking of cells. So some cells can transport molecules, um, liquids, particles, other cells inside of them. That's what a white blood cell does. Um, as I said, it requires energy. And what happens is the cell actually just wraps around it and engulfs it and um, brings the uh, organism or whatever it is inside of itself. And some of the cell membrane actually pinches off. And we've talked about this in previous chapters. So phagocytosis is the endocytosis of either whole cells or large solid matter. Now, in a human, the only cells that phagocytize um, would be like microglia in the uh, central nervous system or white blood cells in the form of a, some sort of phagocyte, like a macrophage. Penocytosis is the endocytosis of liquids, such as oils or molecules um, in some sort of a solution. And in our body, in a human, we do this. It, we do it in the kidney tubules. It's one of the ways that we get things out of the renal filtrate back up into the blood. So the definition, I guess in a human, is a moving cell does phagocytosis and a non-moving or stationary cell does penocytosis. But technically, phagocytosis is solid matter and penocytosis is liquid. So this picture here, or table here, just discusses some of the things we've pretty much talked about um, and um, some new things. So this is showing simple diffusion. We spent a lot of time discussing this one here. Um, this one here is talking about what's called facilitated diffusion. And if you facilitate something, that means you help it. Um, you sort of move it along. And so facilitated diffusion is still diffusion meaning it's going from high concentration to low concentration which means that it doesn't require energy the problem is it doesn't just pass through the membrane and so what we have to do is we have to create a way for it to get through and what we have are these things that we call carrier proteins that actually aid the process so it doesn't require energy because um, the concentration gradient will, will cause these whatever these little purple squares are, to tend to want to move to this right side of the cell until when? Until equilibrium is met. And so when we have the same concentration on both sides, this process is going to stop. So in actively um, transported molecules, as we just saw in the video, we have carrier-mediated active transport, which is what we just showed. And this requires ATP, where we're pulling something from one side to the other. I don't know what this is, but what we saw in the video was the sodium potassium pump, which we have in our uh, muscle cells and our nerve cells. Um, with group translocation, it's similar to this. I guess the only difference is that it, 
the, the product is actually converted as it goes through. So you've got these little hot dogs and these uh, green squares that as you pass this through the carrier protein, it also acts as an enzyme to put them together into whatever that thing is. And so this other category is bulk transport, and this includes, um, endos this is endocytosis. So phagocytosis and pinocytosis. Uh, so you can see phagocytosis, there's a solid uh, object that it's engulfing, and pinocytosis, it's liquid. Which of the following terms describes an organism that derives its energy and carbon from organic molecules? Photoautotroph, chemoheterotroph, lithoautotroph, chemoautotroph, photoheterotroph. And the, or the answer is chemoautotroph. As I've made mention of earlier, uh, bacteria live in any environment you can imagine. Obviously, some uh, are more ideal than others, but you can find them from waters of hundreds of degrees um, to waters of below zero degrees to even ice, um, as well as varying pHs and um, dryness levels and, and so on and so forth. And so these bacteria have developed mechanisms to be able to live in these environments uh, because of evolutionary adaptation. So we're going to kind of go through just some of these specific factors and talk about uh, some of the um, significant features of them. So we're going to start with temperature. So unlike a warm-blooded animal like a human, uh, microbes can't control their temperature. They don't have thermogenerating mechanisms built into them. And sort of like a cold-blooded animal like a fish or a reptile, um, they are going to function differently in different temperatures, um, even to the point where they won't be able to survive. But also, just like these other animals, there is a, a, a range that is not always the same, and it might be uh, wider in some species than others, um, but there is a range of temperatures in which uh, they grow the best in, which would be the ideal temperature. And so there are some names of these temperatures or these ranges uh, that we use to describe how these species grow in them. The first one is the cardinal temperatures. And this is any range in which a particular species can grow in. Okay, And, if, and that goes from the highest to lowest. So the lowest is called the minimum temperature. Um, makes sense, I guess. Uh, so anything below that is unsurvivable by the species. Uh, the maximum temperature is the highest, uh, anything above it will also lead to death of the species, or at the very least, um, with either of these, just non-replication. Um, um, the optimum temperature, the optima, is somewhere in between those two temperatures, and this is the rate at which survivability is the greatest, which um, is where the fastest uh, growth and reproduction and metabolism and whatnot um, occurs. So there are some names for these organisms that grow best at different temperatures. The first one is called psychrophiles. Psychro means cold and file means love. So psychrophiles love the cold. So the optimum temperature for a psychrophile is something below 15 Celsius. 
um, and they can grow as low as zero Celsius or even below and zero is freezing. So these are obligate with respect to cold, meaning psychrophiles can't grow where it's not cold. So there is some overlap with another one that we're going to discuss uh, called a psychrotroph. They can grow in the cold, um, but they are not obligate to the cold. So when we try to uh, cultivate these things, uh, that's the wrong word to use because uh, we cultivate vegetables. Um, what I meant was culture. And uh, when we try to culture these things, we've got to put them in a refrigerator. So normally we incubate these things in something uh, warm, uh, an oven that's something around you know, 30 to 40 Celsius. Um, with these things, we have to put them in a refrigerator to incubate them. So the natural habitats of these bacteria or psychrophilic fungi algae or, algae or whatever are lakes, rivers, snow fields, ice, and so on. Um, rarely pathogenic, and if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because where are uh, humans going to cross paths with these psychrophiles at any rate that's going to lead to any kind of evolutionary um, adaptation where they would become pathogenic to a human? They don't want to grow on humans because we're not the right temperature for them, so why would they ever develop those mechanisms to become pa a pathogen? Um, psychrotrophs, as I mentioned earlier, can grow in the cold, but their optimum temperature is 15 to 30. So we're talking getting close to body temperature. Uh, Staph aureus and Listeria monocytogenes are examples of this. Um, these things can grow in the refrigerator, and these are what cause food poisoning oftentimes. Uh, if you leave something in the refrigerator too long and you pull it out, my wife calls them science experiments. Um, when you pull these things out and you got some kind of weird, you know, kind of slimy, waxy stuff growing on the surface, don't eat it because it could be one of these things. Uh, mesophiles, meso means middle. So they like it in the middle of the road. And the middle of the road is, r hovers right around uh, body temperature above it and below it. And so these mesophiles are the majority of the medically significant microorganisms, the one that we're, ones that we're concerned about regarding pathogenicity of humans and whatnot. So these things grow between 20 and 40, which uh, is like high 60s to low 100s um, in Fahrenheit. And body temperature is 37 Celsius. Um, so they inhabit animals, plants, as well as soil and water in warmer areas. Um, the ones that particularly uh, infect humans, their optima is between 30 and 40. So we're talking 86 to, you know, like 100 and four Celsius uh, Fahrenheit um, and, and you may be thinking about fever right here the next category are called thermoduric uh, therm means heat and doer is the same root word of endure and so these things can endure heat so they can survive short exposures to high temperatures um, but normally they exist as mesophiles so they prefer living in roughly the same temperature as a mesophile, a little bit higher. However, they can endure temperatures of, you know, approaching in the 50 degree Celsius range. Um, common contamin contaminants of heated or pasteurized foods, uh, because when you heat or pasteurize the food, uh, if it's not done for enough time or high enough temperature, these things can survive. So examples are heat resistant cysts such as Giardia. So when you're out in the uh, wilderness and you're boiling your water, they tell you you're supposed to boil it for a minimum of, I believe it's one minute. Um, but just to be safe, you should probably do it for five or 10. And that's to kill these spores um, or cysts. And so other spore formers are Bacillus and Clostridium species.
All right, a thermophile loves the heat. Um, so a thermoduric species in, can endure the heat, but it prefers to be in a mesophilic range. Um, these things grow optimally at temperatures greater than 45 Celsius. So they live in soils with high volcanic activity, compost piles. Compost is very warm because of the production of, uh, or because of uh, when, when this organic matter is being broken down and, and uh, chemical bonds are being broken, it releases energy in the form of heat. Um, and then habitats exposed to the sun. So these thermophilic species prefer to be somewhere between 45 and 80 Celsius. And, and remember that 100 degrees Celsius is boiling. But their optimum is somewhere around 70. And just bear in mind, most eukaryotes can't survive above 60 degrees Celsius. And the last one we're going to talk about is called an extreme thermophile. These things can go above 80, um, not can, they prefer to be somewhere between 80 and 120 Celsius. So these things will survive boiling water. I think that the main place that you find these is in the um, vents in the ocean where it's so deep that the uh, heat from the earth's core is causing um, the water to actually boil and they actually have, there's bacteria that actually live in these things and there's probably probably hundreds of thousands of species that have never even been discovered because it's just so hard to get down here to those areas to study them so this uh, figure, figure 6-5 in your book, um, just shows the range of some of these. So psychrophile, psychrotroph, mesophile, these are the ones that are more clinically significant. Um, thermophile, they love the heat. Um, and then extreme thermophile, look at their optimum temperatures. So here's boiling right here. So we're like way up above boiling. All right, so that was temperature. Um, the next environmental factor we're going to discuss are gases. So the gases that we're most concerned with are oxygen and carbon dioxide. They're certainly the most significant gases. There are other significant gases, but as far as the majority of microbes go, um, they use either oxygen or carbon dioxide. Okay. So oxygen has the greatest impact of the two, and it's important in what we call respiration. Um, another thing that we'll discuss in, in, a, in a chapter uh, coming up is the ability of oxygen to oxidize. So regarding gases, microbes fall into one of three categories. Um, those that use it, and can detoxify it because oxygen is extremely toxic because of its oxidizing properties. Um, those that can neither use it nor detoxify it and those that don't use it but can detoxify it. So how do these things deal with the oxygen? So as oxygen, um, as these things come into contact with oxygen and the oxygen is is turned uh, or used in different chemical reactions, it's transformed into s these toxic forms of oxygen because they're so reactive. So the first form of oxygen is what is called singlet oxygen, which is signified by this little one up here on the top left in su uh, superscript. Uh, so I don't know why your book talks about single oxygen as, as being just a, uh, an atomic oxygen and I'm not I'm confused as to why it does that I don't know if it's a mistake or something that I don't know but oxygen generally when it exists alone it exists as molecular oxygen um, because it's got unpaired electrons and in order to become stable it pairs with another oxygen in a covalent bond um, it's a, a double covalent bond because it has two um, 
it, it needs two more oxygens to in order to get to 10 oxygens to be stable. Um, anyway, so what this singlet oxygen has to do with is molecular oxygen. I don't know if I need to go into detail on this. Um, this is not significant for this uh, lecture. I just, if I, I, it's going to be hard for me to explain it without just going into detail. But this, this part that's not on the slide that I'm going to tell you right here is not going to be on the test. Anyway, so it's an electronically excited oxygen form, which makes it less stable than normal oxygen that we call a triplet oxygen, which is instead of having a little one up here. It would have a little three, and that's what oxygen exists as most of the time. It's called its ground state, um, and the two uh, unpaired electrons are in separate orbits. Okay. Anyway, again, a little more detail than we need for this class, but it's hard to explain it if I don't go into detail like that. So this singlet oxygen is extremely reactive and can destroy a cell because it oxidizes the lipids in the membrane. So when you oxidize a lipid, it, um, it's an, a redox react, an oxid, oxidation reduction uh, reaction um, that you guys have probably heard about because when an oil goes um, bad or gets oxidized, we call it going rancid. So if you're old like me and you remember when we used to use real oil instead of all these trans fats and in the foods that we eat uh, things used to go bad a lot easier um, another very common and highly reactive oxygen form is what's called superoxide ion and so this is where this oxygen molecule actually has an extra electron to make it a negatively charged uh, polyatomic ion and again very very reactive um, another form, which is actually a, a molecule with hydrogens on it, is hydrogen peroxide. So it's toxic to the cells, and that's why people use it as a disinfectant. Not a great idea most of the time. Um, generally, it's better just to wash off your infection or your wounds with saline solution. Um, but it definitely will kill the bacteria. The problem is sometimes it creates more damage to your own tissues, and it ends up making the healing worse. Uh, another form is hydroxyl radicals. So sometimes they're called, no, that's not true. They're not free radicals. Um, but this radical, this hydroxyl radical, also known as hydroxyl ion, um, notice that if you add this to an H+, plus, which is what creates an acid, um, we end up with H2O, which is water, right? So this is the other piece of the water besides the proton. Um, this is what makes a um, solution alkaline or basic. Uh, this is why we use Clorox to kill things because it's highly reactive and it will destroy um, organisms. Um, so chlorine bleach is it because it, it's because it creates these hydroxyl radicals. Um, another form that's not mentioned in here is ozone, which is O3. That's another form of oxygen that's also highly uh, highly reactive and they use it actually in foods to kill pathogens. Um, or anything living in them for that matter. So most of these cells, the ones that can tolerate or process the oxygen, have developed enzymes that neutralize these reactive oxygen byproducts. So it's a two-step process and it requires two enzymes. The first one is superoxide dismutase. So what this thing does is it turns superoxide ion into hydrogen peroxide. So we use two protons and the superoxide dismutase converts the two protons and the two um, superoxide ions into a neutrally charged hydrogen peroxide which is this H2O2 plus we have one extra oxygen molecule which is um, going to be non-reactive. In fact it can be used in cellular respiration. Um, the other one is called catalase, and we will actually discuss this uh, again in more detail. And that takes the hydrogen peroxide and converts it into water. And 
of free oxygen. So that's what this is showing right here. So we got we start with two hydrogen peroxides, we use the catalase enzyme, and we end up with two waters and one oxygen molecule. So um, we've got, if you look at the numbers here, we've got four oxygens. Two times two is four. And so we look over here in the water, we've got two here. So two times one is two, and then two over here. So we still can account for all of our uh, oxygens there. And of course water and oxygen are harmless. So if you look at table 6.5 in your book, it goes through kind of what these cultures would look like for some of these different um, oxygen use patterns in these microbes. So these are just classes of oxygen usage that we're going to go over and it just discusses how to culture them. So they grow these things in a medium called thioglycolate, which doesn't allow oxygen to penetrate. And what that does is, is it allows us to culture um, both the growth of aerobic and anaerobic microbes. So wherever they are exposed to air, an, uh, aerobes will grow, and where they're not, the anaerobes, or where it's not exposed to air, the anaerobes will grow which is down deeper in the test tube. And we'll show you pictures of that, okay? So oxygen concentration is highest at the top of the test tube. Um, therefore, that's where we're gonna see the growth of these aerobic um, bacteria um, right up here toward the top where the oxygen is. So this would be an example of an obligate aerobe because they have to have the oxygen. So they won't even be able to grow where there's not oxygen at all. So we'll see just a tiny little growth pattern right there at the top. So these, as I said, do have the enzymes needed to process the toxic oxygen, and they're obligate examples. Most fungi, that's supposed to say protozoa, and now it does. Um, and many bacteria like bacillus species, mycobacterium, tuberculosis, which causes TB. Um, Microaerophiles is sort of a subcategory of these aerobes. Um, they don't grow at normal atmospheric concentrations of oxygen, but they do need a little bit of oxygen. So where the oxygen concentrations are high, they won't grow. Where they're medium or just a little bit, they will grow. But where there's no oxygen down here, they will not grow. Examples, organisms that live in soil or water or in mammal hosts that are mammals, um, can't be directly exposed to atmospheric oxygen. Um, example, Helicobacter pylori, which uh, lives in the stomach, which uh, is implicated in causing or at least living in uh, gastric ulcers, uh, at Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease. Um, facultative anaerobes don't require oxygen, but they do use it when it's around. So these things have the ability to perform anaerobic and aerobic metabolism. So that's why this thing here will show growth through the entire column, all the way from where oxygen content is high, all the way down to where it is pretty much gone. Um, examples are these gram-negative intestinal bacteria like staphylococci. So anaerobes then, pure anaerobes, don't have the ability to metabolize the oxygen. So obligate anaerobes don't even have the enzymes for processing the toxic oxygen products that are produced and will die when oxygen is around. And so that's why you see the growth of these away from where the concentrations of oxygen are. Um, examples, many oral bacteria and intestinal bacteria. So these oral bacteria will create plaques to keep themselves away from the oxygen. Um, aerotolerant anaerobes, as the name implies, can tolerate oxygen in its presence, but they don't use it, okay? 
so not harmed by the oxygen because they have the ability to break down the toxic uh, oxygen products. And so you will see these things just like with the facultative anaerobes, uh, aerotolerant anaerobes will also grow throughout the entire column. However, you're going to see a, a solid growth pattern at the bottom with the aerotolerant anaerobes, which you will not see with the facultative anaerobes because they grow absolutely just as well with absolutely zero oxygen. So examples, some strains of lactobacilli, streptococci, and clostridium. And this is the table uh, to which I was referring. All right, so that gets us through with oxygen. So how about carbon dioxide then? So CAPN is the word part that refers to carbon dioxide. Um, hypercapnia is, is a high level of oxygen in the blood, for example. Um, so capnophiles, then, as the name implies, are species that grow best at high levels of carbon dioxide, higher than normally present in, in, uh, in the atmosphere, which is, uh, you know, in normal air, we're talking like less than 1% oxygen, or carbon dioxide, I mean. So when they're diagnosing certain species, they may put uh, them in a high uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide in order to see what survives so they can diagnose them, such as Neisseria, Brucella, Streptococcus pneumoniae, which of course causes pneumonia. Um, and an, the next one is uh, pH. So pH is defined, they say it's, as I said, parts hydrogen, because we're, we're really measuring how much hydrogen ions there are, which are, which are protons. But it measures the acidity or alkalinity of a solution, and we express it on, as I said, the pH scale, which goes from 0 to 14. I don't remember if we've talked about this already or not, so I may be repeating myself. Um, so 7 is the pH of pure water, which is neutral. Uh, because something toward the 14 side has a higher concentration of hydroxyl ions, which was OH negative, and things that are farther toward the zero side have a higher concentration of H plus, or hydrogen ions, which is also just a proton. So if you take equal parts of hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions, you end up with pure water, because if you put H plus, together with OH minus, you end up with H2O, which is pure water, and that's how we get water being the, the seven, which is in the middle. Um, so as the pH, oh, I kind of said this, toward zero is more acidic, toward the 14 is more alkaline. So the majority of organisms live or grow in habitats around six to eight, because when they get exposed to these stronger acids and stronger bases, by the way, you know, we and they, have the ability to neutralize um, weaker acids and weaker bases, but when you get into the stronger ones, um, it creates damage by pulling molecules apart. And when you pull a molecule apart, then you ruin it, and essentially it just eats things away. Um, acidophiles, now you're getting the hang of this, you know that this means that they love to be in an acidic environment. So obligate acid acidophiles, such as euglena metabolis, uh, grows in acid pools that are almost as acidic as you can get. Thermoplasma, these things live in coal piles, apparently. Um, also at a very, very low pH, really, really acidic, 1 to 2. Uh, Picrophilus or Picrophilus thrives at a pH of 7, which is neutral, but can live at a pH of 0. So there are some molds and yeasts that tolerate acid very well, and these are the things that if are you know they they get into your pickled foods like pickles, um, will die. Now that's why we use vinegar. That's what pickles are in is vinegar, and that's why we use vinegar. And, and by the way, that's why they put vinegar in certain foods like that disgusting bottled ranch that you can buy that I won't eat um, because there's just so much stinking vinegar in it. it. They they put it in there in order to kill the bacteria. And by the way. 
mayonnaise is not as bad as once thought. You know, it's got enough vinegar in it that uh, it's always gets blamed for what causes food spoilage, like in the, you know, dreaded potato salad at the picnic. Um, it's unlikely, however, that that's where the uh, food spoilage came from. But anyway, the vinegar is very, very acidic, and that's why it doesn't allow bacteria to grow. So that's why vinegar will, will uh, preserve your food. Okay, that's enough about that. All right, so how about alkalinophiles? Well, of course, they like alkaline conditions. Example, Natrimonas live in hot pools and soils, but th what's significant is the, heat, the pH of it is 12. So um, I don't remember what the pH of like Clorox bleach is, but it's not 12. Uh, Proteus can create alkaline conditions so that they can actually neutralize uh, acidity that they're in, such as like acidic urine, um, and they can in colonize and infect uh, the urinary system and cause urinary tract infection. Um, next environmental factor, osmotic pressure. So osmophiles live in habitats with a high solute concentration. In other words, they live in hypertonic solutions. So now you see why we learned that earlier, right? Therefore, they can resist the high pressures that will, uh, I shouldn't say high, I should say partial pressures or osmotic pressures that will want the uh, water to leave the bacterium or, or whatever the species is. Uh, halophiles, halides are the, are the, um, the far left column, uh, like sodium. Um, halophiles prefer high concentrations of salt. Um, obligate halophiles like uh, halobacterium and halococcus can be in as high as 25% sodium chloride, which is table salt, um, but they must be in at least 9% sodium chloride. So these things, uh, which is about, I believe, what, what ocean water is, somewhere around 9%. It might be just a tiny bit less than that. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, but um, very, very high levels of sodium. And, and of course, most bacterium, bacteria can't live on salt or any kind of sodium solution because they just dry out. The water leaves the bacterium and they just desiccate. That's, again, I mentioned this earlier, but that's what salt pork, uh, how, why that was invented. Uh, facultative ha halophiles are resistant to salt, but they normally don't live in saline environments. So example, Staphylococcus aureus, which causes staph infections, can grow um, from in a, in a solution ranging from 0.1% to 20%. Um, so let's see. Uh, isotonic saline in the, in the human is like 0.9%. So these things will grow very, very well um, in a saline environment that's the same uh, so, uh, concentration as, as the human body. All right, another factor, radiation. So phototrophs, photo is visible light. So these things can use... Uh, the visible light as an energy source. So these are photosynthetic, right? Um, Non-photosynthetic microbes tend to be damaged either because of the direct radiation like ultraviolet light or because of the products that are produced from the um, energy of the radiation. Uh, besides photosynthetic phototrophs, some of these things actually just have pigments um, like a carotenoid pigment, so the, the, like a vitamin A derivative pigment um, or something similar to it that absorbs the light and actually dismantles the oxygen. Uh, UV and ionizing radiation can, you, can be used for microbial control. They use it in the food industries a lot, um, like uh, x-rays or ionizing radiation, for example, and they will use that to kill bacteria in meat. For example, they run it through an x-ray machine to kill them. And that's because it just creates so much damage. Pressure. So barophiles. Um, baro means pressure like a barometer measure, measures air pressure. These things exist um, under pressures that range from a few times over normal uh, 
atmospheric pressure to over a thousand times the pressure of atmosphere, which would be places like in the ocean, really deep in the ocean. So these are deep sea microbes oftentimes, um, strictly adapted to high pressures, and when they come up to normal atmospheric pressures, they actually explode. Uh, just like if you blew a balloon up 500 feet you know, below the surface of the water and let it go, it would explode in terror before it ever got to the surface because it would expand so much. All right, so how about other organisms? So we've talked about uh, inanimate objects and, and whatever at this point, but how about other living things? Obviously, you know, bacteria don't live all by themselves. There's almost always something else around to compete with it um, or help it. So nearly all microbes live in shared habitats, and they end up with these co very complex associations with each other um, between either similar species or even very dissimilar species. So sometimes they work together, sometimes they work against each other. And they can also have associations with multicellular organisms like animals or plants. For example, they can, uh, as I said, coexist with them mutually, or they can be parasites or whatever. Um, so interactions, as I've sort of been mentioning, can be beneficial, they can be harmful, or they can be neither just inconsequential to either one. Interactions can also be obligatory, meaning they can't live without the host, um, or non-obligatory, meaning they can take it or leave it. And they often involve nutritional interactions among each other, sort of like, you know, humans, for example, we have bacteria living in our, in our colon that produce vitamin K, and that's the major source of vitamin K in humans. Um, so let's kind of diagram out this association between these organisms. So starting with what is called a symbiotic relationship. So that is when, uh, and I, it seems like we've talked about this, I think we have, um, organisms live in a relationship that both of them, um, or one of them, uh, needs the other. So one of those forms of symbiosis is, is mutualism, which is that both uh, organisms need and benefit from each other. The next one is called commensalism, and that's where one of them benefits and the other one doesn't, and the one that does benefit is called the uh, commensal. And then the last one is called parasitism, so the parasite is the one that's dependent and can't live without the other one, and it's the one that benefits. And in parasitism, the difference is that the host in parasitism is harmed, where commensalism, the host is not harmed. Um, Non-symbiotic relationships. Uh, the organisms are free living, and they do not require a relationship to survive. However, uh, sometimes it's better and sometimes it's actually worse. So um, in synergism, the members of the community cooperate with each other and share the nutrients. In antagonism, uh, some members are inhibited or destroyed by other members. That's where uh, the discovery of penicillin came from. They noticed that there was no bacteria growing where the mold was growing that, produ uh, the, that produced the antibiotic. Um, penicillin. Um, so that one would be, would be an example of this antagonism. So let's talk about this in a little more detail. So symbiosis is the term uh, that describes when two organisms live together. So the symbionts are, what are the members of the uh, symbiosis. So there's three main types, as we've mentioned, mutualism, where they're mutually beneficial, commensalism, um, where the commensal is benefited where the other one is just nothing and parasitism where the parasite benefits and harms the host. Okay so antagonism and synergism. Antagonism is the association of free living species where the uh, members of the community compete. So antibiosis, um, anti means against, bio means life, so an antibiotic is against life, in other words, it kills. Um, 
these th this antibiosis is where these um, one species uh, forms some sort of a uh, inhibitory compound that kills the other species. So synergism is the relationship between two organisms um, that both are benefited, but not necessarily are not necessary for survival. So this is part of the non-symbiosis, and this actually produces results that can be uh, can't be uh, produced um, with just a single species by itself. Uh, examples are gum disease, uh, dental disease, some inf blood infections, um, where these bacteria are synergistically affected by each other. Um, so, one aspect of synergy are these things called biofilms. So you're looking at a picture of a biofilm there. It's been colored artificially, but just to show you what's what. Um, the, these are mixed communities of bacteria and other microbes that attach in this film on the surface of something. So it's a multi-layer conglomerate of cells and stuff that these cells secrete or form. So the formation of the biofilm starts like this. You first have a pioneer. Um, which is the initial colonizer that attaches to the surface and begins secreting this stuff. Then what happens is other microbes begin to attach to those and they form this what's called polymeric glycoproteins, which is the, the like plaque basically. Um, so it's a polymer of sugar proteins essentially. And what this does is causes, uh, makes a, a better environment for more cells to grow and so they just continue to, to, to populate this area. Um, as they grow, they start to re release chemicals. And we get these interactions among these different species, um, one of which is called quorum sensing. So this is how these bacteria are able to uh, sense if other bacteria are around it. And that will influence the rate at which they grow and the types of... Uh, uh, products that they release and so on and so forth. So the structure of the biofilm is, is sort of complicated. So it's very large complex communities um, that have very different, uh, I guess, nutritional needs and oxygen needs and, and so on and so forth uh, because the different layers of the biofilm will have very different characteristics, okay? So for example, the bottom may have a very different pH or oxygen requirement than the top there because of the different conditions from the bottom to the top. Um, but this quorum sensing involves this a partnership among these different uh, species. So what happens is these biofilms make it so it's very, very difficult to get rid of them. And so it requires uh, uh, different methods than typical. Um, for example, brushing your teeth. You can't, uh, you've got to actually use physical force to get the biofilm off of your teeth. So in a biofilm, the bacteria respond and behave very, very differently than when they're just free living, which we call planktonic. So you know plankton is what lives in the ocean, right? Those are free living um, separate uh, organisms. So when they are in a biofilm, different genes are, can actually be activated because the needs are different, right? Um, they can behave and respond very differently to their environments than when they're in planktonic form. Which of the following describes an association between microbes in which one organism is benefited and one is harmed in some way? Is it mutualism, synergism, commensalism, parasitism, or antagonism and of course we know where one's benefited and one's harmed that is what a parasite does so the answer is parasitism microorganisms reproduce by fission each parent cell increases in size and then divides to form two daughter cells. The progression is swift. 
2 become 4, 4 become 8, 8 become 16, 16 become 32, 32 become 64, and so on. The growth of microorganisms depends on conditions in the environment. The main factors are temperature, moisture, nutrients, pH, oxygen, and chemical inhibitors. Each microorganism has very specific needs in each of these categories. The growth of microorganisms follows an exponential pattern. If there is sufficient water and nutrients and a warm enough temperature in the microorganism's environment, and the other three conditions are right, multiplication is extremely rapid. Under ideal conditions, the generation time for multiplication of bacteria can be as short as 30 minutes. So, in 24 hours, in the right environment, one bacterium can produce over 1 billion offspring. Of all the environmental factors that influence bacterial growth, environmental temperature is the most important. The following graphs depict the change in growth rates of typical microorganisms as a function of temperature. Here is a typical graph showing the increase in numbers of cells of the bacteria called E. coli as a function of time at the optimum growth temperature for the organism. Now watch the way that higher temperature affects the survival of E. coli. As the temperature is increased above the maximum growth temperature, the E. coli cells begin to die. As the temperature is increased, the cells die more and more rapidly until all cells are dead at temperatures above 80 degrees Celsius. Now watch the way that lower temperatures affect the growth of E. coli. As the temperature is decreased, the rate of growth slows until at some low temperature, slightly below 6 degrees Celsius, the cells cease to divide. The cells are still alive and waiting for the temperature to increase so they can begin to divide again. It is the cessation of growth of microorganisms at low temperature and their physical death at high temperature that defines the safe temperature ranges for the storage of foods. So for the rest of this chapter, we're going to talk about how these bacteria multiply and how we count them. Um, and just some other interesting facts about that. So they divide by something called binary fission. Binary means two. Um, if you're familiar with uh, computer language, it has something to do with binary because there's only two um, letters in the alphabet, ones and zeros, or open and closed, or however people look at it. Um, but anyway, in binary fission, one cell becomes two, and as the video said, two to four, then 8, 16, 32, 64, uh, one, uh, let's see, 128, 256, 512, 1028. And if those numbers sound somewhat familiar to you, they probably should because uh, for whatever reason, they use these numbers with like computers a lot for uh, the amount of RAM, for example, that um, you have in your computer. Not exactly sure why. So in this process, which is over here on this right-hand side, the parent cell, which is the very first cell that we start with, enlarges, which is <clears throat> what this is showing here. So it then duplicates its chromosomes, which you can see here. So it enlarges and makes an extra set of chromosomes. One's purple, one's blue, but it's, in theory, the same chromosome. Um, there is probably some variation that generally occurs just in mistakes of replication and so on, and that's how we end up with uh, uh, evolution. So adaptation changes could be bad, could be good, whatever. Um, then the cell envelope begins to, uh, I guess, split in the middle. And it creates this wall in the middle called the central septum which is what this green thing is trying to show here. Um, anyway, it then continues to further divide and you end up with um, two cells that in theory are identical to the original cell that was up here. So the basics of, of this are like mitosis in uh, eukaryotic cells. 
um, bearing in mind there's no mitochondria, there's no membrane-bound organelles, and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, there's some certain similarities, of course. So when studying the growth of bacteria, it's important to understand the rate of growth, um, especially for things like foodborne pathogens and whatnot. So we talk about this thing called the generation time or the doubling time. And all that is is the time required for one complete fission cycle, just you know one cell becoming two, or two cells becoming four, or four becoming eight, or so on. And so what you're seeing here on this picture is each column here represents a generation. So when we go from this to this, that's one generation. So one becomes two, four, eight, 16, 32. Um, and this down here is showing us the uh, what we have to raise the starting value to to get the number. And bear in mind, you can't if you raise one to anything, it's always one. So you got to at least start with two, but you could start with, you know, a thousand. It doesn't really matter. Whatever you start with is what you're going to raise it to. So if you start with a thousand and you double it, you're going to end up with 2000, right? Um, but if you double 2000, um, I shouldn't say double that. If you, because each cell, you're raising it to a power. So a thousand to the first, thousand to the second, a thousand to the third, which is a thousand times a thousand times a thousand. Um, that's how we actually get these numbers here. Um, this isn't drawn all that well either. This is not a linear. This should absolutely not be a, a straight line. This should curve sort of up and this one should curve sort of down because this is going to get massive here very, very quickly. Um, there's another ch uh, chart that we'll show you that's a little better than this. Um, but the rate is constant. And what that means is the, the time that it takes to double doesn't change, even though the absolute number changes dramatically. Um, if it takes 10 minutes or let's say an hour to double, it's going to take an hour to go from one to two or from a million to two million. It makes no difference. So as I said, a generation uh, increases the population by a factor of two. So as long as the, the conditions are favorable, doubling time will continue forever. Now that doesn't happen. It, because of this concept of being a closed system, like we'll get to a little bit later, um, it might double for a while, um, but after a, a, at some point, it's got to flatten out. So I think we've said this, but the length of generation time is the growth rate. Um, average generation times going from from uh, one to two or two to four is um, 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, shortest of some organisms can be 10 to 12 minutes. Um, Mycobacterium leprae is 10 to 30 days. So there's some significant variation, obviously. Um, environmental bacteria could even be in months. Um, and that's just because of, you know, conditions vary so greatly. Uh, most pathogens have a relatively short generation time. And that's just an adaptation for them to infect their host quickly um, to be able to spread themselves. So here is a different kind of curve um, that shows the, the growth rate. And this is the curve I was talking about earlier that where it should slope way up. So when you're just measuring the absolute number of cells, it's as it doubles, it, it's going to start out kind of slow. But, you know, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. And then all of a sudden, it's going to start getting just massive. And that's what we call exponential growth. So we can also measure that same exponential growth in terms, this is going to get a little bit mathematical, so I'm sorry, but I have to ex at least explain this. Um, and we're talking about, when we talk about logarithmic growth, the logarithm of something is what you raise it to. In other words, if you raise it to two and then to three and then to four, and so that's why the logarithm is a line because it's going to go two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in, in a line. So um, for every hundred thousand it's got here, or whatever this is, it's raised to a power of one and then raised to a power of two and so on. Um, so you can you can measure it either way. 
it just I guess depends on the, the, the circumstances um, so I guess that's what this is showing here so when I'm saying powers this is what I mean raised to the first raised to the second raised to the third which uh, hopefully you guys know from you know math class 2 to the first is 2 uh, which is just 2 2 to the second is 2 times 2 so you do 2 twice uh, 2 to the fourth is 2 4 times so 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 and so on and that's why you get this growth curve right here so as I said this is a measure of just the power that it's raised to so 1 2 3 4 that's why it's a straight line so graph by plotting the number of cells as a function of time and that again I'm definitely getting ahead of myself so I'm sorry uh, but that's this red line right here um, plotting the data arithmetically or by arithmetic which is different from a geometric pattern um, again I'm getting into too much math here I'm sorry but um, arithmetic this is this all goes back to sequences in math so an arithmetic sequence is um, just a growth rate that stays exactly the same all the time so the size of the population can be calculated by this um, this is in which is the number of cells present um, and the T tells us that it's in terms of time um, not in terms of time in terms of T which is total um, at some point in time um, so in I there is the initial number and then 2 raised to the n is the growth rate okay so t denotes some point in time um, n to the i represents the starting or initial number uh, n denotes the generation number for example if we start with 10 cells and we go through 10 generations this is what the math is going to look like so our initial number is 10 which is n to the i and 2 which never changes um, raised to the 10 because we went through 10 generations and we would end up when you do this math with 10,240 cells which equals in T now we can also rearrange these for example if we have 1600 cells and five generations we can figure out what we started with so we just rearrange this uh, equation right here so we know what we started with and we know we have two raised to the fifth so if we take and isolate this initial number here by taking uh, um, dividing both sides by 2 to the fifth then we end up with n t over 2 to the fifth which looks like this 1600 divided by 2 to the fifth and we know that if, if that's what we have now we ended up with or we began with 50 cells so anyway it just gives you an example probably not a bad idea to run through a couple of those on your own just uh, to figure that out um, so when we do these cultures to measure the numbers we need to understand that these are closed systems so that means they have a finite amount of nutrients and a finite amount of space so they're not going to grow and grow and grow forever at some point something's going to slow the growth rate down um, there, another problem with a closed system is there's no mechanism for waste removal and waste is toxic and so when the toxicity levels build up it inhibits the continued growth um, so they don't continue to divide at their maximum rate so the growth curve becomes this fairly predictable pattern um, when it's in a closed system and so we have a process for measuring this um, we first of all have to put some certain number of cells in a um, sterile medium so we don't get any contamination obviously this just goes back clear back to like chapter one um, in culturing bacteria um, we have to incubate it and so it can go through uh, several doubling times right and then we just sample this at regular intervals and, and, and um, plate them and count them um, and we just plot that number over time and then we can get an estimate of what the doubling time is of it so when we put the colony um, we, we start out with the um, when we plate them we assume that each colony is from one 
cell. Okay, if we have it diluted correctly, then each one of these dots is going to be from one cell. So this is a colony of cells. So we start, we call that a colony forming unit. And, and this is what it should look like over time. Um, it should get more and more and more as the um, as the uh, bacteria continue to multiply. So because of that, we're able to sort of just estimate over time. Um, and it's not going to be perfect, but when you average out the line, you're going to be pretty accurate by the time you get to the end. So you just graph them on the curve like we showed earlier, and that's how you can calculate this. So this table right here, or figure, whatever it is, it's um, figure 611 in your book, shows uh, the, the broth that we're growing these things in, and then they just dump it out and plate the broth. And this is showing the number of these colony forming units, one, two, four, seven, um, the total estimated colonies. And this, in theory, would continue and continue to some point. So this right here is what shows the stages in a closed culture. Something will limit it eventually, and that's why it grows and grows and grows, and then all of a sudden it begins to flatten out at the top so we don't continue to grow. Um, it doesn't go down in population, it just stays fairly stagnant. So each of these areas of this growth chart have a name. So the first one is called the lag phase. Um, this is the beginning flat period of growth. Um, it takes for whatever reason a while for these cells to begin to start dividing. Um, they have to, I guess, sort of adjust to the environment and determine whether or not it's a good time to divide. And then, of course, they have to go through those stages of binary fission where they have to enlarge and then um, duplicate the, the, the nuclear material and so on and so forth. But at some point, they're going to begin to divide, and then they will continue to divide. But they're, during the lag phase, they are not at their maximum rate. And... Um, it's a very dilute, uh, I guess, there's just not a lot of the colony forming units in there, so you may even miss them when you are trying to plate them out. So it appears to be not growing. They are, they're doing something, but it's kind of like interphase of mitosis. I mean, it doesn't look like something's going on, but there really is something going on. Okay, from there you go into the second one, which is the exponential growth phase. And this is what we said was also called the logarithmic phase, or the log phase, um, because we're measuring it in the powers. And that's why this is a straight line right here, um, because this is the log of the cells, meaning the power that the uh, initial um, number is being raised to as we grow. So in this... Uh, the actual number is geometrical, okay? So the, that's the population um, so of the actual cells, but the sequence of the log is, is arithmetic. Um, so this will keep going on as long as there is adequate nutrients and favorable environment, meaning there hasn't been a huge buildup of toxic waste products and things like that. From there, we end up though eventually hitting this stationary growth phase which is the flat one at the top, right? Um, this is where the cell birth and the cell death rates are equal. So however many number of cells we're multiplying by binary fission equals the number that is dying, okay? So we also begin to see a, a slowing down of the binary fission. And this is because of nutrients being depleted as well as oxygen, um, is, if this is an aerobic, uh, bacterium um, and a buildup of the waste because of the excretion from the normal metabolism. That then leads us to the death phase. Um, so the cells begin to die at an exponential rate, not necessarily the same rate that we grow, grew in because look this steepness is not, this, this is like a 45 degree angle, well it is a 45 degree angle, this is not a 45 degree angle so it's not dying at the same rate that it was growing before. Um, and that all depends on the resistance of the species, how toxic the, you know, the environment is, and so on. 
Uh, I guess I already mentioned this, but slower than the growth phase. So that can lead to this VNC, this viable non-culturable state. So the cells in this state are still alive, but they're not dividing. So they're just dormant. Um, because of this, they aren't going to grow in a culture, and they're going to appear to be, uh, it's going to appear that there's no cells still living, but there actually are. Um, so I guess when conditions become more viable again, they will start to grow again. So why do we care about this? Um, some things that are important to understand is when these microbes are in an exponential growth phase, they're more vulnerable to antimicrobial agents and heat because they're actively growing and so it's easier to disrupt the metabolism and one important feature uh, yeah I guess feature of this is that if a person is actively shedding bacteria in these early phases of, of an infection they're more, more likely to spread infection. And so you hear people say, well, I'm not contagious. Well, what they're talking about is because they're in the end stages of this and the, and the um, cells are dying and, and not easily spread. So there are some uh, machines that can be used rather than doing this by hand in order to uh, look at the growth. One is called a chemostat, which is an automatic growth chamber and what it does is it continues to give the bacteria a steady stream of nutrients and somehow siphons off the used media and I guess dead or older bacterial cells and somehow leaving the other bacterial cells. And what this does is stabilizes the growth rate. So they use this when they need to uh, create a massive number of um, bacteria in things like research. Um, there are other ways too of counting these cells besides plating them out and counting them with your eyeballs um, or at least more specific ways. Uh, one is by checking the turbidity um, which is something called tur turbidometry. M meter means measure, right? Um, so the turbidity is how cloudy the uh, solution is and the, it's assumed that what's making it cloudy is stuff dissolved in it right which would be cells bacterial cells so the cloudier it is the more bacterial cells we have in it um, another more specific way of counting is what we call direct cell, cell count so you still use a microscope or this is where you use a microscope rather than looking at colony forming units which are macroscopic you can actually look at these under a microscope on this gridded uh, slide. So you actually have a slide with a grid um, right on it. And then you can use that to count the cells and um, get, a, I guess, a closer uh, estimate of the number of cells. Another uh, way of doing it is this thing called a culture counter. So this thing has some sort of a detecting unit in it that can actually um, scan the cells as they pass through um, a, uh, a little pipette. So as these cells flow down this thing, somehow this thing is measuring, measuring them. Um, I don't know if it's like a brake beam sensor, um, like when you walk through the door at you know the 7-Eleven and it beeps at you, or I don't exactly know how it works, but somehow it can measure these things. Um, a flow cytometer is similar to this, but somehow it can actually determine whether the cells are alive or dead. Um, and it, it can even tell when you introduce dyes into the solution whether the cells are gram negative or gram positive. And the last one we're going to talk about is something called genetic probing. And so this is using a real time polymerase chain reaction, which is Part of the, um, we'll probably talk about this. I don't know if we will, maybe we won't. But when you are trying to um, 
map out DNA. They use this polymerase chain reaction as part of the uh, replication process of DNA so that they can actually look at what chromosomes are present. Um, so somehow they're using this real time to determine the number of bacteria or whatever other organisms are pre present um, in some sort of a sample or, a, or like, like a tissue sample. Put the steps of bacterial growth curve in the correct order. Death phase, lag phase, exponential phase, stationary phase. So we know it starts with lag phase, then the exponential or log phase, then the stationary phase, and then the death phase. And that is chapter 6.